our next speaker who I should introduce um, is uh, Sonia Frankie Arnold uh, from the University of Glasgow, and she's going to talk to us about um, structured light and structured atoms. So uh, whenever you're ready, take it away, Sonia. Thank you, Josh. Um, can you see my slides? Not yet. Okay, I've tried sharing. I'm sure it's coming. I'm sure it's thinking. <laughs> I try again. Yeah, try again. I can't even press on the button of share screen. Ah, what? Okay, as always, technical hitches. Um, if you if if you want to sort of you know close and open again or something, then um, that's that's fine. We can wait. Uh, uh, we even we even tried before the. It, it worked a second ago. It yeah. worked a second ago. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I can see it. That's, I, I, think, I think something's happening. Something's happening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we can see it. Okay, perfect. So, I'm going to start now. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to participate and talk at my very, very first uh, ever video conference. And I hope that all the technical difficulties are now done and we don't need to do any more of these. So, uh, this is for a little bit of light entertainment here. Um, Structured light and structured atoms really describe very much what we do in Glasgow in my team. And I want to illustrate that here with two, on the slide, with, with two images from our lab. The left-hand side, you see a structured light being structured in its amplitude, phase, and polarization. And um, you can see that um, there the, are the different, different areas of polarization. The polarization varies across the beam profile, where uh, red means right polarization, blue means blue polarization, and green is, is linear polarization. So on the right-hand side, instead, you see a beam, which is an, sorry, not a beam, but you see an absorption profile of our cold rubidium atoms, which have interacted with a structured light beam, and where we can uh, change the absorption or the, the opacity of our medium at will, position by position, depending on the polarization of, of the light. So you may well ask, what is quantum about all of this? And indeed, I feel like a gatecrasher at this quantum information party. I blame the organizers for allowing me to speak. But seriously, if you've got any ideas of how to implement a quantum or quantum analog protocols with our systems here, I'd be very interested to hear from you. So I'm going to start talking a little bit about structured light to introduce the idea. Structured light or, or vector light has become a popular issue. The idea really is, of course, every light is, is a vector field. It's just the nature of electromagnetic radiation. But the idea is that we try to use as many degrees of freedom, as much information, pack as much information as possible into a single photon. And even if we just restrict ourselves to a monochromatic paraxial CW light beam, which is not very quantum at all, then we can write our electric field, of course, in terms of uh, different polarization components. And we can shape the complex amplitude or the amplitude and phase both of, of both of these individual components individually. And that gives us more possibilities than with the conventional homogeneously polarized light beams. So this is how that looks like in the lab. If I, for example, shape my horizontal polarization like this here and my vertical one like that, I add those two together, then I get something that depending on the phase between those two components looks like a Lagia Gauss beam. And if I then plot the polarization profile of all of this, I get something like this radial polarized polarization, which is measured data from our lab. Um, and you see at the right hand here, we get a radial polarized beam. If we simply change the modes in the horizontal and vertical polarization, we get azimuthally polarized light, um, as you can see here. And of course, um, I am choosing horizontal and vertical polarization, but indeed any two-dimensional any two-dimensional basis system will work. And if you're interested, like we are often in rotational symmetric situations, um, in that case, or angular momentum, for example, in that case, maybe a cylindrical coordinate system will be more suitable to your needs. And we can instead parameterize in terms of the radius and the azimuthal angle of our light beams. Or maybe even more bizarre, if uh, we could use the modes that you see here, so these azimuthal beams or the radial beams as our polarization system. So these as well are legitimate polarization degrees of freedom, and they become interesting in particular if we are interested in strong focusing, because then one of them stays as it is, and the other one converts into longitudinal polarization. 
However, in this talk, I will concentrate, as I said before, on paraxial beams, and uh, we can forget these safely for now. Maybe a different way to think about that is uh, with these beams, what we do is we couple different degrees of freedom. We couple the polarization degree of freedom defined in a two-dimensional state space with spatial degree of freedom. And here I'm using my favorite uh, spatial degree of freedom, which are the Lagia-Gauss modes, and I'm uh, showing here only the phase of these. What we can do then is we can combine all of these different degrees of freedom at our will. So we can take any two spatial modes in our different polarization components. And if we do that, we end up with an interestingly polarized light beam. And the one at the latest one we prepared in the lab as well, it's a Poincaré beam, if you're interested in such things. But generally we've got a lot of information that we can pack into our photons here. So usually I should warn you that these modes usually are not eigenmodes of propagation, they change, but they're, topological, uh, they're topologically robust. So of course there are many different ways to realize such beams, and we're not the first people who do that, but we do pride ourselves as having developed a system that is particularly easy to handle. And we now often uh, have um, project students who learn in, in no time how to operate this, and some of the images I've shown you are indeed uh, images uh, taken from data from our project students. So what we do here is we've got a laser beam, um, could be a single photon source if you so wanted, um, that emits pol polarized light. We then split the polarization in two different beams and each of these polarized, differently polarized beams is impinging on the, um, on the DMD, on the digital mirror device at a different angle. Now a DMD really is just a fancy diffraction grating, if you saw one that can be programmed in any way you want. So what we want to do is we want to bring those two back together and we do that by displaying a multiplexed diffraction grating, which uh, superimposes both of these beams again at the same place. But in addition to this diffraction grating, we also imprint something that changes the amplitude and the phase of the individual beams. And by doing so, directly after the beam, we have, a, we have something that is exactly our vector vertex beam. This is the way how our, um, this is taken directly in, in an image of the DMD surface. And here you see the grating displayed just for one of these beams. And here you see the multiplex grating, which combines, kind of combines uh, both, both of these uh, holograms at the same time. So it's really easy to operate. The question is, how quantum are these beams? And some people um, con conversely, conversely talk about classical entanglement. So I really don't want to talk about classical entanglement because I don't think there's such a thing. However, um, you'll see that there's a formal analogy between quantum entanglement and the beams that we can generate here. So if you, take, if you think about quantum entanglement, I'm not telling you anything new, uh, then a state is quantum entangled if it cannot be written as a product state. However, this, so this, this non-product state uh, shows a correlation between the polarization of two different photons, um, which can be locally displaced, of course. Now, in case for our classical light beam, we've got a similar non-separability in degrees of freedom. So we can write our electric field as a correlation between the spatial and the polarization degree of freedoms here. So we get something that is known as contextuality. If you're cheeky, we can just write that in a pseudo quantum notation, mm -hmm. where we get something that formally looks very similar to a quantum state. Obviously, our states can mimic quantum behavior, but they cannot mimic non-locality. On the positive side, they are incredibly easy to generate, as I've told you, and they might find applications therefore. So the big question is, how quantum are our classical beams? And we're working in a two-dimensional state space and we're working with pure states. So a possible definition of the quantumness is, uh, the, or the measure of, of entanglement is the concurrence according to Wouter's definition. So any two photon state can be written as a superposition of these different varieties of both photons being horizontal, one horizontal, one vertical, and so on, and both photons being vertical. And depending on the coefficients, you can reach all the way from a product state. If we set C and D equal to zero, the concurrence is zero. And what you end up here is a state where one of the photons is always horizontal and the other one is always diagonal in some sorts. And on the other extreme, we've got a concurrence of one 
if we have, if we set B and C equal to the same number of one over square root of two, then we get the Bell state and we've got a maximally entangled state. Now the analog for us is to either make a homogeneously polarized state um, that has just the same amplitude everywhere, or instead if we decide to have our horizontal and vertical polarization in orthogonal modes to each other, then we get something that is analog to a Bell state, to a maximum vector state, if you so want. And of course, we can do anything in between with the concurrence between zero and one. The difficulty for us is that while polarization is a two-dimensional state space, uh, the spatial modes are in a two-dimensional subset of an infinite dimensional state space. So whether we have this state, or this state, or that, or that, they all have the same concurrence. But if you wanted to measure that, you would need to measure a very, very high dimensional system, and that is complicated. Before, however, telling you how we do it, I will talk a little bit about how do we do the tomography of our states. So the bit, I um, forgot to mention before, the bit that actually is a bit similar to an EPR paradox is this idea that if you know the spatial distribution of a photon, then we can predict with certainty its polarization state and vice versa. So reminiscent of EPR. But you can turn that upside down as well by actually measuring the intensity in the different polarization components. And from that, we can get information about our state. So what do we want to, if you want to do proper state tomography, you need to know for each position within our beam, what is the polarization, which means we need to define the alignment of the polarization ellipse and the ellipticity itself. Or if you so want, we need to find the, the, the angle, sorry, the phase between the horizontal and the vertical polarization component that gives us uh, the ellipticity, the degree of ellipticity. Experimentally, we can't measure phases very easily, but you can measure intensities. And it turns out if you just measure the intensity behind um, pol different polarization settings in uh, all of the mutually unbiased spaces or a subsection thereof, then we can resolve a spatially resolved Stokes parameter, which just tells us something about the difference in intensity position by position between the horizontal, vertical, the diagonal, anti-diagonal, and the right-left polarization components. And from all of this, we can find exactly how our polarization profile of the beam looks like, and that's exactly what's at the basis of what we're doing here. The question is, what can we say about the state if we don't use a camera in order to record all of these different polarizations, but instead if we only use a photodiode after the polarizer. So rather than getting all of these images, we only get the number of the horizontal polarization, vertical polarization, and so on. What we can do in that case is we can derive a global Stokes parameter for our whole beam, and it turns out that from this alone we can get the concurrence, the degree of quantumness of vectorness of, of, of our state, if you so want. And for the one that I've shown you here, for example, I've just calculated that the concurrence is 0 0.98, so it's close to a maximally vector beam. I must say it surprised me, but there are some people who said this is absolutely obvious because clearly the degree of coherence is related to the concurrence. And I should also warn you that this is only true if you have a pure state. If you instead have noise, then that simulates quantum uh, entanglement or correlations that actually isn't there in reality. We managed to show that by generating beams that reach all the way from a homogeneously polarized beam, which is uh, just, a, just a, yeah, a beam which can be written as a product state of polarization spatial degree of freedom, all the way to the other side to something that is similar to a Bell state in our degrees of freedom. And we see that uh, the, the um, measurements are quite similar to what we expect. Question always is, uh, is this useful? And for sure, one can use this strong correlation between the different degrees of freedom in order to either derive polarization from camera measurements or to track the position of a particle from polarization measurements. There's a lot of ongoing work on building an analogy with quantum light, which allows tests of quantum protocols, many other applications. And of course, you can actually also realize these uh, states with individual photons, which are entangled. Our claim to fame at Glasgow University is, of course, to throw in some atoms. 
atomic media facilitate nonlinear optical processes and they allow us to couple optical and magnetic transitions. Question then is, if we just restrict ourselves to dipole interaction, what happens if our electric field now is one of these vector states? Now, different regimes you could realize. One of them is very difficult, and so far it's just theoreticians working in this area, and that is by positioning an atom or an ion at the very center of a strongly focused vector beam so that the atom will sense the whole vector structure, the anisotropy, uh, directly, and that enables you to uh, facilitate magnetic or quadrupole transitions that are otherwise unable to, to, to work. We are instead working in a different regime where we place our atom in a particular place within this inhomogeneous field. So the atoms react to the local vary varying polarization. And in this kind of regime, you can induce spatially varying dipole coupling, you can have optical pumping, birefringence. And what we do is we can have a spatially dependent electromagnetic or a EIT. So our interesting probe beam couples different transitions in our atoms, inducing a different phase at different positions within the beam. And we close this transition by having a transverse magnetic field coupling the lower ground states here as well. By doing so, we can imprint polarization information onto our atomic orbitals and we can observe spatial dependent EIT. So some of our very early measurements, we come in with a beam where the sigma plus and the sigma minus component, of course, don't interfere. So what we see is the typical donut structure of these beams. But after they've passed through the atoms, we see that uh, the light has been absorbed at some places, but not at others from our atoms. A little bit more detail, what we do experimentally, we have rubidium 87. We trap our atoms in a magneto-optical trap, then dynamically load them in a spontaneous optical force trap. And that conveniently brings our atoms into the F equal one state where we can exactly excite this relatively clean atomic transition that we have here. And if we do that and put a different, different vector beams onto our sample here, what we get is we get absorption profiles that can have rather a lot of structure. So for example, here we've got 400 fringes imprinted into our atomic variable. Maybe a bit more easy to understand what is going on is the following. Uh, we couple atoms, vector light, and magnetic fields. What you see here is the profile, the, the polarization profile of the beam. And you see that at eight positions for this particular beam, the polarization is perpendicular to the magnetic field. And exactly at these positions, uh, the atoms are transparent to the light. And that's what we get here. Some very preliminary results. I'm just going to show you the movie of the onset of this idea. And Finally, I want to say that we can use this if we rotate the magnetic field, we can actually uh, determine, we can, we, can change, uh, we can change the absorption pattern and vice versa, we can look at our absorption pattern and from that deduce the orientation of the magnetic field. So this is the team that is responsible for all of that. The people in, in blue are the people who did the atom work and the people in lighter blue are the one who did light work. And with that, I conclude and thank you for your attention. Great. Um, great. Th thanks so much, Sonia. That was a fantastic talk. Um, I, I hope I didn't uh, rush you at the end, but, but uh, we, we do have a, 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 a few, few minutes for questions, actually. Um, yeah, uh, really cool. So, so um, um, I, I should read out some of the most popular questions. Um, uh, someone is asking uh, anonymously, uh, can the structured properties um, be guided in a waveguide? So, for example, through a fiber. Very good question. Um, we have just started, uh, well, I've got a research um, fellow who's just started trying to do that. So we're interested cool. in having topological waves within our waveguides, where we hope that we can build interesting, I mean, ideally what you want is you want to build a Möbius strip where you, where you kind of include topological ideas with, with, with these light modes that we have. So we're working on it. It's difficult, well, it's, it's different because of course you need to fulfill the boundary conditions of, um, of the waveguide. Yeah, yeah, abs abs absolutely. Um, I, okay, but very interesting, yeah. Um, and um, uh, so another follow-up question there is, um, do you think that, uh, this is from Dan Shepard, um, are these types of light likely to have applications in sensing, do you think? Yes, definitely. So, so at least we hope so. 
um, because uh, I think because you can get sensitive, you can have increase, for example, polarization sensitivity. So if I rotate my interesting beam by only one over L of, of an angle, I get as much signal, signal as if I would rotate a normally polarized beam by 180 degrees. So I get an ah. increased sensitivity. However, we are at the very That's beginning of looking into this. It also has applications uh, already now uh, because these beams can be focused potentially to a smaller um, beam profiles than, than usual beams. So we're working together with microscopy companies trying to get better images. Yeah. Very, ah, that reminds me, it reminds me of noon states. Is that a thing? It's somehow your sort of classical entanglement gives you higher sensitivity. Um, yeah, maybe. So I, I would love to explore that further. If anybody has ideas of what to do, we, we definitely can make any beam you're interested in and uh, we would love to collaborate. That's very cool. Um, and there, I said, the questions are streaming in. Um, uh, have you tried to generalize the concurrence measurement uh, that usually involves two qubits to systems of higher dimensionality? Again, a very interesting question. So we do believe that we can make GHZ states, but we haven't, or we, we know that we make GHZ states almost involuntarily, but we haven't really looked at um, how the concurrence would, would, uh, would generalize. Um, it's very interesting. And, GZ states be, be meaning systems of, of, of sort of a, a system with at least three sub, three sub. So you would have three degrees of freedom, for example. Um, you could you have, could have timing in addition to polarization and, oh, wow. and spatial dimension or path. Very interesting. Um, right. So interestingly for us, of course, polarization always drags it down to two dimensions, no matter about the, the huge size of your spatial dimensional system. Um, but it would be interesting. That's, that's a very good question. We should we should go of a path entangled, uh, path and spatial entangled photons, and see what we can do. <laughs> that's very cool. Um, and we do. Just wonder. Oh well, okay. Uh, I'm gonna. I'm gonna. We have a, another minute. Or so. I'm just gonna ask my silly question, uh, which was. Um, uh, I, I mean, you, so, you, so you have this sort of entanglement between polarization and spatial modes, and you mentioned this application of sort of tracking particles, and it made me think a little bit about ghost imaging. Do you, is there like a formal connection there with ghost imaging? Do you know what I mean? Um, I, I'm not sure I see the okay. link to ghost imaging. Maybe I don't either. I was a little bit wondering. wondering. I just wonder, I mean, so that already answers the question that, it, that that's not a, hasn't been a, well, for that, maybe you have to talk to the people at, uh, at Max Planck who have done uh, the application there. So we, we did the opposite. We, we, we've built a polarimeter which measures, which just takes a camera image and from that deduces polarization. That's very cool. Um, and we, so uh, we still have another uh, two minutes actually before Alex is due to start. So, um, uh, Okay. Well, okay, so there's actually one, one more question. Do, do you think you could give some examples of quantum effects that could be studied using these beams? Uh, but, you know, presumably anything where non-locality isn't a key feature. Um. So people have already simulated quantum protocols with these systems, but the difficulty is uh, exactly, exactly that, that you can't have non-locality. So if you want to do cryptography or something like that, you're just stuffed, I, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I think, so Andrew Forbes group is, is very, very strong in, in trying to find lots of quantum applications. I, yep. I, 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 don't, I don't know. At the moment, I think it works quite well for testing quantum channels with a classical system, which then yeah, okay. um, will, will work on the quantum regime. Fantastic. Yeah, I've, a super interesting talk. Thanks, for, thanks very, very much. Um, and uh, well, so clapping on behalf of a large number of people, I've actually forgotten where it shows how many people are watching, but it's loads. So um, thanks very much. Let's, um, uh, thanks Sonia, let's move on to our next speaker.